Thanks to everyone for staying to, uh, to the end, not the bitter end, but the end. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you all a few questions. Um, how many people here are in government or politics? Raise it high, you can be proud, it's a good thing, <laughs> a few, there we go. How many people in business, journalists, and nonprofits? Any ballerinas or artists? None, okay. A few, look at there's always a few in the crowd. Um, I wanted to start off by um, sharing a little bit of research because a lot of times I come to conferences where people are talking about government and no one actually hears the voices of the public servants. So one of the things my company does, you guys getting feedback? One of the things my company does is we, we survey public servants to get a sense of um, as they're thinking about this question of the future of government, what are they saying and how do they make decisions? So this is not, I don't want to say this is statistically relevant. You can imagine the number of public servants in the world. I'm going to show you um, 7,000 respondents from 97 countries, but it gives you a flavor of what public servants are thinking and how they make decisions. So when public servants need help or policy decisions, they turn to mostly published research, if they can find it. Then they turn to external um, experts, then other fellow public servants, and then their own grit and ingenuity. So mostly external folks. Many of you, how many people are in businesses that have reports that they send to government? We're in Brussels. I imagine a lot of you, that's your business, right, mostly? When making big decisions, the information source um, that public servants trust the most is pretty, pretty basic. Again, if you're in the business of doing research, they trust you their own experience, and external experts. So a lot of external forces in. Public servants believe that um, what would take their work to the next level is, I want to really point this out for the DLD crowd, it is what? Networking with innovators. They say time and time again, the problems we have, because it's Tavi, some of the things you're talking about, we can't solve the problems within our internal workforce because the world's changing so quickly. They want to meet people like you. That's why I wish we had more people with government interacting with people in business. Public servants think the usefulness of collaborating with others lies in getting advice. They really want your advice on how to do government quite well. And then finally, just like in any Buzz, BuzzFeed quiz, we ask them, um, what sort of public servant are you? And you can see that most of them are directors. But there are a large amount of innovators in government. A few of the unsung heroes self-identified. And I think a lot of people see um, people in government as wonks. Um, only 13% of them say they are. And the rest of them are a little bit more like, like a director. So I want to shift um, a bit to the panel. Um, or totally to the panel, and um, ask you guys a, a few questions. The topic we were given was around the future of government, basically, and how do we build a dynamic government. Um, I can't help but start with you, a member of the EU parliament, a, a German from Bavaria. I was mistaken, and I said, my husband's Bavarian, and he said, no, he's Niederbayern. I said, okay, sorry. Um, I'll get it right next time. Um, uh, promise. Um, should governments be dynamic, and what are the downfalls of a dynamic government? I mean, we just had the case that uh, winter is coming, if not. Yeah, the question is, how do you define dynamics in, in government? So, of course, uh, uh, government should uh, address uh, solutions to problems which occur, and uh, even from the Estonian example, we learned that there are some things which are linked only to real Estonians and not to e Estonians, and the government building process is linked to this behavior, which we call votes. So therefore, uh, that uh, was important for me to hear that uh, there is still a distinction between e Estonians and Estonians, and uh, on the other hand, this government also delivers services to the E-Estonians, and that is a question how the E-Estonians are represented in the years to come. A very nice question. Good luck for that. Because of <laughs> that will address a lot of, of new problems no one has in mind uh, for the moment. On the other hand, to be honest, um, governments are not front-runners in technologies. Governments are not front-runners in uh, dynamic developments. Governments have to organize an environment where things can take place. And I think that is uh, what Europe tries to deliver as well, to create an environment. Uh, single market is such a kind of environment. And I listened very carefully this morning what uh, Mr. Seelmeyer said, and of course what Mr. Oettinger said, although it was more linked on budget issues. But um, one solution for 28 member states, or 27 in two years, or two, one and a half years' time, is better than 27 or 28 different solutions for the same problem. 
And if you want to be a single market, similar to the United States, which is a huge single market, uh, it makes sense to invent these things. Our problem is that we have not been founded in 776. <laughs> we started in, in 1957, so a lot of things have been already developed on national level, which in the United States no one had in mind to build it on state level, as no one knew in the 18th century that there will be planes and you need air traffic control, only to mention one of these problems, and I could uh, elaborate a lot of that. Um, but uh, if a government or governments are organizing a good environment, then dynamics can happen. If uh, you have restrictions, and we have a lot of examples, thanks God outside European Union, because that is not linked to our system, where uh, governments think they can decide on everything and can have everything under control, that are not the most dynamic economies and are not the most dynamic links uh, to the people. And therefore, that belongs on the definition how dynamic something should be. I think uh, our model is quite okay, uh, but uh, it will never be a system where institutions, sorry I have to say that, Europe is not a, uh, European Commission is not a government, <laughs> it's an institution, the Free State of Bavaria has a government of course, and the city of Deckendorf, mm -hmm. but um, um, administrations will never be the front runners of uh, creating dynamics, but uh, they have to organize an environment where things can happen. So, Limo, I want to, um, I, I have a feeling of a strong, we had a really nice um, sort of warm up session. We got quite a debatey. I have a feeling you have a strong response around um, how quickly governments should be changing and how they might be changing. You work in robotics and AI. You, you've worked in tech in a lot of different ways, but now you're in robotics and AI. I think you would say winter is coming when it comes to um, the amount of jobs that may go away. Tell us sort of what you think, if you had advice to government, what should they be doing now? Uh, how do we respond to this? So the, I think the imminent threat on, on the Western dem democratic framework is, the, um, is automation and AI. So it's, it's now going to go into an exponential curve whereby uh, most of what we call labor and jobs will be replaced. Um, and it's a process, an inevitable process that will happen over the next few years. And so the, the question is, what, uh, what are we going to do? And, um, and if we, we don't, we don't, we're not needed in order to, to, to sustain productivity, in order to sustain uh, growth, then, then uh, how, how does government play a role in sustaining our lifestyle? Because if today, if 50% of the population is, is uh, in one way or another um, being sustained by tax money of the creative class, uh, it's going to increase dramatically. And, if, uh, and so the role of the government needs to be so clearly out there to sustain a, a, a decent quality of life. And, uh, and so the, the inefficiency of the four-year election cycle and the, this, uh, this uh, parliamentary circus of uh, decision-making, um, it was okay after Marie Antoinette, but, it, but we've progressed since then. And, and there are tools today to, um, to create a more, a more dynamic environment, digital tools uh, and, and AI, and, and, and there needs to be more involvement of of uh, statistics and AI in decision making. There needs to be more direct involvement of people in decision making, especially with regards to what they're doing with our money. Um, and it's no longer uh, possible to sustain the, the complexity and the growth of population with, um, with a centralized power. It's, it's, uh, it's looking pretty bad in the last few years and it can only go really bad. So I have a question for the audience and I have a question for you. Does anyone know of a government that is crowdsourcing its budget? Portugal, with ATMs. So there are governments on the run, sort of doing this, trying to get to their citizens and listen. Let me go to income. Um, there's a lot of talk around um, what to do with these jobless people. Um, there's talk of universal basic income. Is that the answer? Well, it's part of the answer, but I think it's more about sustaining uh, a lifestyle. So. Uh, what is deemed to be, uh, it's, not, it's not about how the money, if I get a thousand euros a month, then that value of a thousand user, uh, thousand 
euros can change. The question is, what is deemed to be an essential quality of life for the constituents? And, and that's, that's what the government needs to sustain. It's, it's happiness of the constituents that need to be defined. And you think UBI should be part of that? And I think it's the only way, because otherwise it will not be competitive. It's like running a hedge fund uh, without an edge. So let's go to Estonia, you're, you're way ahead on e-government, e-citizenship. Two questions for you, where, where do you all sit on universal basic income and sort of how does that go in, in what you all are talking about? And the other question is, I mean, clearly Estonia has been very good at this. There are people from other governments here, either as citizens. What do they need to do to push forward? Like, what's the sort of attitude, what do you need to do to really push for this more... Some people call it disruptive, other people say dynamic government. Can it happen everywhere? Are there certain conditions that make it happen? Uh, yeah, I'll, I think I, I will answer the second one first. Uh, we call it innovation for pain. So you need to have a pain to, to push the innovation through. And someone, sometimes you have to cause uh, a pain to society to make things happen. Like, like for example, just giving an example, all the schools are using in Estonia the so-called e-school e platform that like all the grades and next day topics, everything is there. To achieve that, it was essential that all the teachers are actually starting to put information there. But how you tell to the teachers that starting from tomorrow you need to like, be fully digital? And you tell it in year 2002. Like, 2002, it was like, internet, internet was less than 10 years old. Like, so, uh, I mean, the internet, you know, like, was ten, less than 10 years old. So uh, the headmasters agreed that uh, the teachers won't get paid before the grades are in the system. So the implementation took two months. They were not happy. The stick. Yeah, but it worked. And now everybody loves it. Like, uh, fantastic. So you have to have pain. I mean, you have to understand that certain things only happen if we all contribute or it's, some, it's, it's painful to somebody. And everything, the development and, and disruption stops when, uh, like, when people don't want to feel pain anymore or they, or they feel comfortable or convenient. And that's, that's the problem what I see is that uh, uh, in today's digital society or digital world, things can happen so fast. Then, I mean, take the Nokia example or like the, it's the, the whole Finnish economy example. Like two, ten years ago, 30% 30, 30 of Finnish economy was connected with one company. And you might lose it all like, in five years. So uh, things can happen fast, and then and, and you, you, you actually should focus, and then you should understand what is like the say, main thing you're after. So I'm actually agreeing that there cannot be like, like pensions to everybody like, in future. Like, the system needs to be changed. Yes, I mean, like... Uh, to go public salary, or like, like that. Uh, it might be a solution, but that I think it's more even more important to understand like uh, what is the job of the government in future? Like, should we provide all the services ourselves, or like should we outsource something? Like, to give you an example, like Estonia has outsourced our protection to NATO. I mean, we pay the two percent. We truly pay the two percent, even more. Like so. Uh, we outsource that. Or, How much I mean, is that? Like, it's in, the, in every country, it's the same thing. Like, you take a GDP and you calculate 2%. No, I know what 2% is, but do you know what the, how much money that is? I know it's small. <laughs> so it's <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> very small. <laughs> no, it's not so small, but yeah, like, yeah. it's enough. But uh, my point is that you can do that. And uh, I mean, think in these terms, like, what if 50% like, of your education is given somebody from outside? or 50% of your healthcare is provided with somebody who's outside. Like, outside of the country? Yeah, I mean, like, like for us, I mean, we still have uh, so uh, military service that we have to do, but we understand that, like, a bigger part lays outside and we use it when it's needed. Like. So, uh, so I think that's the challenge, to understand, like, and the focus, and, 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 and through the focus, uh, through optimization, through smarter, um, using AI, um, like governments can be more competitive and can create more wealth to the people. Marcus, will governments become more dynamic only through pain? 
Are you more optimistic that there can be pleasure involved in your work and here in Brussels? <laughs> I thought by myself that I should elaborate why at the end we decided uh, to become democracies and what is all this background behind that and uh, what we learned even reading Plato and Cicero about the way of rulings and governing. Uh, uh, continuing then what uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke taught mm -hmm. us and all this stuff, because I think we have to bring that into remembrance. Um, the political process to deal with, uh, for the race, public, uh, for race publica, for the public issue, means to organize a kind of um, sampling and waging, uh, weighing all interests which are available and then to come to a conclusion. Um, I think if today, after the knowledge uh, UK people have, uh, there would be a referendum of staying or leaving, we would have a different result uh, than when it took place. And uh, even if I look to my country, to Germany, we are those who are the one day the most optimistic ones, and the next day all the concerns of all the world lay on our small sh shoulders, so we are really highs and ups uh, from day to day. And it belongs on the date when you ask people what to do. <laughs> and I think that is not the process uh, really to decide things. And, and if we disagree fundamentally on that, then in general we have a problem, whether it makes sense that this um, dealing with different interests is a public issue and has to be done by someone. And uh, I have sometimes the feeling, even here on European level, also I see some uh, stuff from the Commission, I will say it, uh, they think they are a kind of aristocracy, <laughs> aristocrats. So the best are serving for Europe. Uh, and we learned uh, that at the end, uh, that becomes a bad thing as well, which can be a kind of oligarchy, that only a few are serving for, for Europe. and. Uh, uh, that is not one of the best solutions of, of dealing with things. So only asking experts, only asking, uh, making studies as a decisive process, I think is not enough at the end of the day. And that is something we have to, to bear in mind all the time, that this uh, democratic process, uh, this fight for different uh, solutions on, on, on similar problems, so we have in Germany for the moment, national election campaign, that is very important, and of course, the political process is more than only deciding from a daily mood or from something else. To find a balanced approach on that, I think that is the main political uh, issue which has to be done in a professionalist way, way, but of course, always reflecting what's happening to, in the public and to be honest, uh, uh, discussing with the public. That is something I'm sometimes missing. So what are the channels to discuss, what are the possibilities uh, for the people uh, to take influence, to articulate their interests and all this stuff. But uh, I think we have solutions for that. But I can't see that that can be replaced by robots, by uh, technology or, or whatever. Uh, I think this process is more complex uh, than it can be dealt um, with uh, things I have heard uh, during the day. I have another problem, to be honest, as uh, we are still a representative democracy here in the European Union and I'm a member of the European Parliament. I got uh, minutes, uh, minute by minute SMS from my staff that I have to go there as we have votes now in the ECO. You're Congress. leaving us right now. I have to leave because I have to fulfill my so, obligations. So my electorate wants me to join the votes in the committee. And for one thing, I'm even the rapporteur for the parliament, so I really have to leave, sorry for that. But according to the plans, we sh should have been ready 10 minutes ago. It's not running <laughs> on Swiss time today, yeah, I, I take it. Sorry for that, it's not why I don't, want, I don't like this discussion, but uh, uh, seriously, the votes have started uh, already. So I'm sorry that I have to leave you, but I want to keep you in mind that the political process is a little bit more than only looking to opinion polls and looking to some experts. That's not enough, to be honest. Great. I'm always struck by, feel, feel free to please go vote or do whatever you need to do. I'm always struck. I worked in American politics, including presidential politics, for about 25 years, and no one ever quoted Plato um, or even talked about Plato. So I just the... You even read it and agree. The, the, the contrast. You guys want to move over? You feel so, so far away here. L let me ask... Um, 
let me ask you, he's making the argument that people, that, that you still need politicians and bureaucrats in government. Would you be so as bold to say, just leave it to the crowd, just send it out to the citizens, have everything up for vote, we don't need them anymore. Shut the place down, let's just go straight to the citizens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. How about you? System still needs to be managed, so I'm not so sure, but, but definitely one thing I disagree, and, and uh, where I disagree is, the, is, the, is how, I mean, how, how this whole country thing has been seen. Countries are monopolies at the moment, or at least people think that, or politicians think that it's a monopoly, that the services we provide to our people, that's a monopoly. I mean, new baby is born, I will basically put it into my register. New company is born, they will pay taxes here in this country. Yes, you're absolutely right, this has been the case. But it quite soon, it's not the case anymore. Like, the same thing, the same example I wanted to do with, with the music, people will start to choose what's best for them, and they will decide what is best for them. And if needed, they will vote like, with, with legs, but I mean, they also can vote like, with votes. So uh, being part of, like, in some case, I'm part of, let's say, Belgium, but in some case, in some service, I'm part of Italy, that, that will be a totally normal thing in the future. And now it's a question for Europe, it's a question for European countries, like, will, be, will we be the followers or we set the rules or we, we set the scene how this click game is played? How about you guys? How many think that um, politics and government would be better off fully crowdsourced? Anyone? Take it to the crowd, every decision? A few? How many want to keep the system the way it is? You have one then. <laughs> yeah, you only have one vote. You only have one vote. So give us, give us, tell us why. Why is this such a good idea? I mean, I, I just lived through an election in my country, and I'll tell you, that's what democracy does. I mean, why is this such a good idea? Because we're trapped in in the past. We we what we think of you know when we think referendum, we think Brexit. But if you had referendum five times per day, and you had to study in order to 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 vote, and and today you can learn anything. I mean, you can, if, you, if you need to make a voting about nuclear energy, you take the time and you learn about nuclear energy, and, it's, and you can become expert enough. To Wait, you it. really think that the average person is going to take the time to learn about nuclear energy? Not, not everybody about everything, but the complexity... Enough people, enough people will learn? Do they, you screen people for they how... Won't, they won't have anything much else to do. So in the future, we can be in a society where, where the... Um, learning is, is a mandatory thing. So you're, you're basically, instead of focusing on, 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 you know, on BS, you, you actually have to contribute in your opinion, in your learned opinion. So, so, have, so just one second, why not have robots then become the politicians because they'll have all the perfect information and right, make the right decision? Why leave it to the people anymore? You're right. Eventually it will end up not robots, but yeah, AI. But, but let's say as a transition period, what we can do now is sort of say, okay, let's take some of the decision making that is done today in the political world and, and, have a, and, and involve the population with it and, and grow over a period of, I don't know, a generation, uh, people that are, uh, that are essentially are capable of, of running their own hedge fund. I know you want to get in here. I want to ask a question, get in and then answer this question. One of the things I, I think I hear you saying is that um, federal government has gotten too big in some places and that you want people closer to the decisions. That's, that's part of what we're hearing. Your federal government's the size of a city, which is probably the reason why. You're far apart from each other, but you're, you're quite smaller. Do you think that size matters? Are, are governments just too big and they should be broken down in its component parts? Would that really help disruption and, and flexibility? First of all, I, I think with, with your previous comment, you actually went to the slippery road, uh, if saying like that uh, like people cannot try, can 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 I'll say learn uh, the nuclear thing, but the politicians can. Come on, I mean like uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, after selling my company, I worked four years for the government as a CIO. Uh, when I went to the parliament with the e-residency law, it was accepted all in favor, nobody ex nobody against the. Journalist asked one of the parliament members, like after the voting, like, "Did you actually understood you voted for?" And the answer was no, but it sounds cool. 
So uh, that, that was the thing. So um, what I want to say is we shouldn't talk about like robots taking over uh, governments or like people uh, like doing decisions in, uh, on behalf of politicians. I think what we should like see here is the process and then the methodology behind it. I mean, like uh, today uh, we see politics and the decisions we made in, in, in a way that, okay, when we set the new rule, it should be there for next, let's say, five, ten years. So we can't change that because I mean, it's like, it takes time to like, redo the laws, etc. I mean, if, you, if there are like any software engineers in the audience, like if you are familiar with agile development and stuff, I mean, like we do new codes every hour. So we like basically are able to put new version of the code up there working every hour. If it goes, I'll say, if it doesn't work, we roll it back and we do it again. And that's how, why this industry is so efficient. That's why this industry changes so rapidly and fast and has this success. Can we do the same with politics? Well, it's happening. I mean, there's an average of one policy lab opening around the world to create sort of carve-outs for this exact agile policy because the difference between coders and creating policy is that if it breaks, maybe your company breaks, but if you're a government and you get the policy wrong, maybe society breaks. So it's not, not, it, not it's a little bit more complex. Yeah, but like if you look at the, uh, let's say, if you take, uh, let's say, let's look at the laws that the, the parliament uh, accepts or like votes every, every day. I mean, a fraction of those laws are actually influencing the whole society. Most of them are actually like influencing only like very particular part. Let's say we, we regulate the, the construction working uh, uh, area. So it's, it's not all uh, like every day about the whole society. Like Brexit, yes or no? I mean, like that's like one per decade question. So you do agile policy on small, should. impactful, and you have slow policy on large and impactful. Exactly. And so two different speeds of how we exactly. do policy. So, and, and that's what we should talk about, like the, the methodology how we do, and also like ability to make mistake. And it has to be, I mean, like every law should have some kind of buffer. Like so, like when, it, okay, it, now it's from 1st of September, it's a new law, but like there might be changes during the next, let's say, three months. And you, you get to go in, should we be doing agile policy? Or should you just leave that to the public? The public becomes the policy makers, or can we talk to the experts now? No, I think timing is, is also a crucial thing. If you have this four-year cycle, um, everything, the whole ecosystem is around this, this uh, market maker of, 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 uh, of events which spike around year two and then uh, go down in planning of whether we're gonna be in, in government or not the next time, and it should be a continuum. There, there should be sort of a, a recyclable, everything should be transient. Everything should be, if, you, if you've got a license to build a building, people don't like it, take, tear it down three months later. There's no, it, we, we are living in a world where tangible, you know, 3D printing, whatever, it's, it, it, there is, you can make things and destroy things and change things even in the physical world, not just in software. The digital is becoming reality. And what's the biggest barrier to that? Is it our belief that we can change things or... What, what's there's stopping us? It's a fear of change, and the people in power are, are aging population that don't accept change. Is that because there's not enough pain? Maybe. Lack of pain. Lack of pain. Yeah. Oh, lack of Do we have pain in Europe? <laughs> Is there not enough pain? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you all the last few questions. Um, optimistic about the state of the world? Yeah, definitely. How about you? Um, I don't know. I'm concerned with, with, with what's going on in radicalism. And, and I think it's, it's more of disempowerment of, of people. Uh, you all, raise your hand if you're optimistic about the state of the world. A little bit more. I think this is the Berta crowd. You all tend to be uh, the DLD crowd. You're optimistic <laughs> people. Let's go to Europe. We're sitting here in Brussels. Um, optimistic about the state of Europe? I mean, for me, it's challenging. We see the power of European Union, we benefit from the Economic Union, we benefit from Euro. I mean, that's part of our game. It's no question like uh, we, will, we understand it like, becomes more and more global. Uh, the competition like, becomes more and more global. And it's, it's up to us. I mean, 
for, for my country to understand like uh, how to be the winner here. Like, so and we, uh, we think at least they have a plan. Optimistic, yes or no, if I want to ask them too. Um, Europe. I'm a bit, a bit optimistic, even though I think people don't read their history books enough these days um, and, and try and find lines, common lines in what happened in the last thousand years. How about you all? Are you optimistic about Europe? <laughs> are you more optimistic about Europe than you are the state of the world? Raise your hand if you're more optimistic about Europe than the state of the world. Moving forward, optimistic. And how, just last question, how many people um, think that democracy is the way forward? For Europe. What do you mean democracy? <laughs> for Europe, not for the rest of the world, but at least for Europe. Well, with that, I'd like to um, thank you all very, very much. Thank you guys for a great panel. Thank you to our parliamentarians.